In October of 1994, a middle-aged man named Ivan, who lived in Estonia, which is a country in Northern Europe, was walking in this forest looking for firewood. This forest butted up against the town he lived in, which was called Tamiku, and so as a result of his proximity to it, he had spent a lot of time in these woods over the years. But in general, his exposure to this forest was just on the fringes. He would only look for firewood along the perimeter of the woods. But for whatever reason, that day he was just really having a hard time finding good firewood and so at some point he decided to just walk deeper into the woods to see if he would have luck in there and so he turns and starts walking into the forest and very quickly when the town has kind of disappeared from view behind him he looked around and kind of liked being in the woods he didn't go for walks in the woods and suddenly he was on this nice nature walk and so he decided you know what i can wait on the firewood i'll just walk in the forest for a little while longer and enjoy myself and kind of meditate so he just continued walking deeper and deeper into the woods and after walking for nearly an hour just kind of mindlessly walking about he sees up ahead there is very clearly a clearing and then before the clearing is what looks like a chain link fence now he's never been this deep into the woods before so he has no idea what this is but he's obviously curious and so he decides he'll go see what it is and so he continues walking closer and closer to what obviously is a chain link fence and as he's getting closer to it the trees around him are beginning to thin out and suddenly before he even reaches the fence he gets a very clear view of what's on the other side and it's this huge multi-story building that almost looks like a factory or some sort of government facility and it's sitting maybe a couple hundred feet away from the fence right in the middle of this property and there's really nothing around it it's just this cleared out big open area with this big building right in the middle and there's a fence all the way around it and so Ivan is totally intrigued by this and so he walks walks right up to the fence, he grabs onto it, and he tries to look and figure out what this building is, but there's no clear signage on it, and there's no people anywhere. It's completely barren. There's nothing but this building. And then he notices there's obviously graffiti on the sides of this building, and the doors and windows appear to be boarded up. And so this building, whatever it is, is clearly abandoned. And the first thought that goes through Ivan's head is scrap metal. Times were tough for Ivan and his family, and so he and his two brothers, they all lived together, they would go out and they would steal scrap metal and sell it for a little bit of extra cash to make ends meet and provide for their big family. And so he's looking at this big building thinking, you know, if I can get in there, I guarantee you there is some metal that I can steal and I can sell. And so Ivan stayed at this fence just kind of staring at this building for a little while longer and continued to look around to make sure there weren't any people that he hadn't seen before. And after feeling satisfied that this really was a totally abandoned building, he turned around and began hustling back towards town. And when he finally made it to town, making sure to grab some firewood along the way, he rounded up his two brothers and he told them about this find in the forest. And they all very excitedly agreed that that night they would go right back out there and they would go inside the building and see what they could find. And so around 9 p.m. that night, the brothers met up and they had flashlights and a set of bolt cutters and they headed into the nearby forest and they marched their way all the way up to this fence that Ivan had found earlier in the day and they lifted their flashlights up and they scanned through the fence all over the property. And when they didn't see anyone, they put their flashlights down and one by one, they climbed up and over this fence. And then once they were all on the other side, they began making their way up to this huge building sitting in the middle of the property. And when they got up to this building, they confirmed it definitely looked like it was abandoned, except all of the doors and windows were sealed in such a way that even with bolt cutters, there was just no way to pry them open. They were not going to get inside this building. And so after a little while of still trying to kind of smash their way into this building, the brothers all linked up and they decided, you know what, we're not getting in. And the longer we stay here, the better the chances are that we get caught. And so let's just head back. And so feeling totally dejected, they turn and they start walking back towards the fence they hopped in on. And as they're walking along, they're kind of shining their lights left and right and looking around. And off to the far right side of the property, there is this small shack that they had not noticed on their way in. And so the brothers look at each other and they're like, hey, you know, we're already on this side of the fence. We might as well go check it out and see what's inside of it. Maybe there's scrap metal in there. And so the brothers turn and start making their way over to the shed. And when they get there, they discover it's only secured with a simple padlock on a wooden door. And so they get their bolt cutters, they pop off the lock, they open up the door, and there's initially nothing inside. At least that's what they think. But they move something on the ground and it reveals this stairwell that leads into this underground bunker. And now it's the middle of the night on this abandoned 
abandoned property they'd snuck into. And so there's some apprehension, but they shine their lights down the steps and they didn't see any immediate hazards. And they're thinking, you know what? This is an adventure. Let's go down and see what's down there. And so they all went down the steps. And when they got down to the bottom, they turned the corner and they shine their light to see what's down here. And what was down there was this huge cellar that was full of scrap metal. There was metal all over the ground. And then there were also these shelves that went as far back as their lights could shine. And on the lower shelves, there were these weird square metal boxes that almost looked like briefcases. And then above those on the top shelf were 55 gallon aluminum drums. And in the brother's experience, these drums were very, very valuable, except they needed to make sure they weren't full of some liquid because if they're full, they weigh like 500 pounds and there's no way they'd be able to get them out and then trying to open them up and spill whatever's inside of them is hazardous for a lot of reasons. And so they walked over to the first 55 gallon drum they saw and they pushed it to see if it was empty. And the drum immediately rocked back and forth, echoing inside, indicating that it was empty. This was a huge, huge win. And so the brothers are totally amazed. They grab this first drum, they pull it off the shelf, and they wheel it over to the base of the steps. And then they go back to get another drum off the shelf. And they reach up, they grab another empty drum. And as they're pulling it off, it dislodges another 55-gallon drum that was nearby that was full of some liquid. So it weighed 500 pounds. And it comes crashing off the shelf and it lands on Ivan's leg, pinning him to the ground. And immediately the two other brothers pulled the drum off of Ivan, but it was obvious there had been significant damage done to his leg. Ivan couldn't even stand up anymore. And so the brothers are looking around thinking, man, this is an amazing haul, but if Ivan can't even walk, I mean, it's going to be a nightmare trying to haul this metal back while also supporting Ivan. And so they decided they would leave now and they would wait for Ivan to heal up and then they would come back and they would collect their amazing haul. And so the brothers, they reached down and they picked up whatever pieces of metal they could to just kind of stuff in their pockets. And then the two brothers supported Ivan and carried him up the stairs. And then they very slowly walked their way over to the fence. And then somehow the three of them got up and over the fence. And then very slowly, they made their way all the way through the forest back to Tamiku. And when they got there, the two brothers helped Ivan get into his house and they put him in his bed. And then Ivan went to sleep. The next morning when Ivan got up, he was expecting to feel better, but in fact, his leg felt exponentially worse. And then over the course of the next 72 hours, Ivan still believed if he just gutted it out and he waited, his leg would get better, but it just got worse and worse and worse. And so four days after this leg injury, Ivan was in so much pain, he couldn't do anything. And so he finally decided he had to go to the hospital. And so when he gets to the hospital, the doctor asks Ivan, you know, what happened to your leg? And Ivan would tell him that, oh, I was in the woods and a tree fell on my leg because he didn't want to admit to trying to steal scrap metal. And so the doctors, they accepted this. It seemed totally reasonable based on what his injury looked like. And so they admitted him to the hospital. They put him in his hospital room. And right away, the doctors and nurses began administering all the treatments and things they would do for a crush injury. But it seemed like nothing was working. Over the course of the next several days, Ivan complained endlessly of the pain in his leg getting worse and worse and worse and the swelling was going up and overall Ivan's health just continued to deteriorate over his stay in the hospital. And then a week after being admitted to the hospital, so roughly 10 or 11 days after he was hurt, the doctors walked into his room and he was dead. His kidneys had just abruptly failed and the doctors and nurses had absolutely no idea why. And so they told the family, we don't know what happened to him. And so the family just had to collect Ivan's body and then they had a funeral for him. But they're all thinking to themselves, how could this have happened? He hurt his leg and then his kidneys failed? It didn't make any sense. But before they could get any clarity on that, they were dealt another tragedy. The beloved family dog just kind of abruptly died. It was young, it was healthy, and so just like Ivan, it was like this totally unexpected death. And so once again, the family's asking, what's going on here? And then just a couple of days after that, Ivan's stepson came downstairs one morning complaining of feeling sick. And when his family looked 
looked at his hands. They were blistered and covered in boils and looked like he had just reached his hands into a fire or something. But he would tell his family, I didn't do that. I don't know what's going on with my hands. I don't know why I feel so sick. And so the family rushed the boy to the hospital. And naturally, the doctors asked him, you know, how did your hands get this way? What happened to you? And the boy would say, I don't know. But over the course of this initial discussion with doctors, the boy would tell them that over the last couple of days, he had been sifting through his stepfather, Ivan's possessions, and he had actually been using some of Ivan's tools from his toolbox. Now, the doctors were already aware of the strangeness around Ivan's death, and they were aware of the sudden passing of the family dog, and now they're seeing this boy who is showing up with these strange symptoms for no particular reason, and so the doctors knew something was off. And so on a hunch, they contacted the authorities and they told them what they thought. And then later that day, the authorities showed up at Ivan's family's house. And when they got out of the car, they were covered head to toe in white hazardous materials suits. And they told the family to evacuate the house for their safety. And then these people in suits got out these special wands and tools and they marched into the family home. And immediately all their equipment led them to this one particular closet near the kitchen. And when they opened it up in the closet was Ivan's toolbox, the same one the boy had been handling over the past couple of days. And when they opened that up, they found there were lots of normal tools you would expect inside of a toolbox. And they discovered one strange piece of scrap metal. It was the only piece of scrap metal that Ivan had grabbed off the floor of that cellar and tucked in his pocket before he and his brothers had left. And then after Ivan had passed away, his stepson had been going through his things and he had discovered this piece of scrap metal. And for whatever reason, he had transferred it from the jacket to Ivan's toolbox. What Ivan and his family didn't know was that that piece of metal was extremely dangerous because it came not from some abandoned building on some abandoned property in the middle of the forest. It came from an abandoned nuclear waste storage facility. That is what Ivan and his brothers had snuck onto. But because Ivan and his brothers had hopped over that side fence, they didn't see any of the warning signs that are posted on the front of the front gates telling people to stay back. Inside that cellar that the brothers were in, those small metal briefcase looking things on the lower shelves were shields for radiation. Inside side of each of them was radioactive metal. And when that full 55 gallon drum came crashing off the shelf and smashed into Ivan's leg, his leg was not the only thing it smashed into. It smashed into one of those metal briefcases and broke it open, sending the radioactive metal inside of it flying out and it landed right next to Ivan on the ground. And so when the brothers scrambled to pick up whatever loose scrap metal there was on the ground, Ivan unfortunately grabbed one piece and it was the radioactive one. By the time Ivan finally got back to his house, he was actually already dead. He just didn't know it yet. That piece of metal had been inside of his jacket pocket and it had been pressed against his body long enough that he had been dealt a fatal dose of radiation. There was nothing anybody could have done even if they knew what had happened to him. As for the dog, it used to sleep on Ivan's jacket and it did so when this piece of scrap metal was inside of it and so it too died of radiation poisoning. As for Ivan's stepson, the reason his hands had been so badly burned and why he'd become so sick, that was just from his brief exchange of touching the piece of scrap metal and then putting it in Ivan's toolbox. That alone had done that much damage to him. When the doctors considered the strangeness of Ivan's death, the dog's death, and now this boy's symptoms, they did suspect radiation poisoning. And so that was how the authorities were able to get to their house and very quickly locate that toolbox. Amazingly, Ivan's stepson and the rest of Ivan's family, including his two brothers, would make full recoveries. However, several months after this event and after authorities had come in and said their house was clear of radiation, the grandmother would suddenly die totally unexpectedly. She was healthy. Nothing was wrong with her. And so even though it was not officially cited as having been caused by radiation, many people believe it's from the exposure she had to this piece of scrap metal.
If you hop in a boat just off the coast of Aberdeen, Scotland, and you cruise eastward, after about seven hours, depending on your speed and the weather, you would come across this massive man-made structure jutting up out of the ocean. It looks like a cross between a construction site and a corporate office building sitting on top of 100-foot-tall metal stilts. It's called Magellan, and it is an offshore oil rig, and it will remain in place until all the oil has been sucked up in that area. The people who work, often for weeks or months at a time, on rigs like Magellan are known as roughnecks, and they have one of, if not the most, dangerous job in the world. All exterior surfaces on these offshore rigs are always slick, either with water or oil, and so there is a constant risk of falling, sometimes hundreds of feet. If you're up on a higher platform, you could fall to a lower platform, which could be fatal, or you could fall clean off the rig, all the way to the ocean, 100 plus feet below. If if you add in some bad windy weather, the risk of falling increases tenfold. Also, the crude oil that these roughnecks are drilling for is highly combustible, and so fires are a huge concern as well. And if that wasn't risky enough, there's also this phenomenon known as a blowout, where basically the oil well that the drill is actually drilling into will just explode. Now, all rigs have some sort of mitigating equipment to try to save themselves in case this occurs, but in reality, if it happens, happens and you are unfortunately near the drill when it happens, you are likely to be killed or maimed. While the downsides of working on an oil rig are fairly obvious, the upsides are too. Namely, your pay is fantastic. In 2000, a 41-year-old father of two named Gordon Moffat was a roughneck working on the Magellan. His primary job was to perform maintenance on the drill. Now, these offshore rigs work great most of the time, but they do have a habit of breaking down fairly often. And for a drilling company, any time they are not sucking out crude oil, they're losing money. And so it was just a known thing when you worked on one of these rigs that as soon as there is an issue that causes the drill to stop working, it must be fixed immediately, whether it's day, night, horrible weather, good weather, it didn't matter, it had to be fixed right away. And so on the night of October 9th that year, Gordon had just gotten back to his quarters to end the day when he got a call on his radio that he was actually needed to come back out to fix a problem that had stopped the drill. Now, Gordon was a seasoned roughneck and he had grown quite accustomed to these late night calls to go out and fix things. And so he wasn't annoyed. He just put his stuff back on, turned around and he headed out the door. When Gordon got to the main deck, which is this wide open metal platform right in the middle of the rig where the drill actually passes down through it on its way to the ocean. When he got to the main deck, he was met by some of his coworkers who told him where he would need to go. The cable that needed fixing was located right below the main deck. However, it was not accessible from the main deck. In order for Gordon to get to it, he would need to go down to the next lowest platform from the main deck. Basically, he would need to hop in an elevator and go down one floor. And from this lower deck, the crew on the main deck would lower down a harness attached to a long wire. They would feed it down through this hole in the main deck platform called a mouse hole. It was about 10 inches across and they would feed it down and he would grab the harness, he would put it on and then he would signal up to the main deck crew who could literally see him through this mouse hole. They would turn around and they would signal somebody called the hoist operator and they were located above the main deck slightly back. They couldn't actually see Gordon so they're relying on communications with the people on the main deck and the hoist operator would start their winch and a winch basically reels in the wire that was connected to the harness that was on Gordon. And so once the hoist operator was informed, he'd turn on the winch and then Gordon would be raised up until he could access these cables and then he'd do his maintenance and be lowered back down and that would be it. Now, Gordon and the crew had done maintenance using this winch system many times before, so this was a very routine fix. So Gordon made his way from the main deck down to the slightly lower deck and he looked up at the mouse hole and he watched as the main deck crew members lowered the harness with the wire attached to it down through the mouse hole and so Gordon grabbed the harness, he put it around his waist and he secured it. And after he was sure it was on correctly, he signaled up to the crew on the main deck that he was ready to start. And they in turn turned around, they flagged the hoist operator who started the winch. And so very slowly, Gordon was lifted off the platform he was standing on and he was brought up after several minutes, all the way up about 10 feet to access these cables. And as soon as he was parallel with them, he waved 
to the main deck crew who were not far from him at this point. And he said, I'm good. And so they turned around, they told the hoist operator who stopped the winch. And so Gordon got his tools out and he began working on these cables. And the whole time he's trying to stay in one place because the wind is whipping through and he's kind of dangling and swinging around. And then eventually he finishes the repair. The cables are good. And so he signals the crew on the main deck through the mouse hole that he was good to go. You can lower me back down now. And so the main deck crew, they turn, they wave to the hoist operator to go ahead and lower Gordon. And the hoist operator, he gives the thumbs up and he starts the winch. However, the hoist operator accidentally forgot to switch the direction of the winch. And so when he started it again, instead of the winch spooling the wire out and lowering Gordon, it continued to reel the wire in, pulling Gordon upward. Now, the winch did not move very quickly. And so it wasn't like Gordon is rocketing up towards the mouse hole. However, this problem was immediately recognized by Gordon and the main deck crew. And so they're frustrated. They're yelling up at the hoist operator saying, stop, 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 reverse the winch. They're all waving and flagging this guy down. But the hoist operator, after he had hit start on the winch, had just kind of turned around because this is a routine thing they'd done a million times before. And so he's not looking at the crew on the main deck. So he has no idea what's going on. And it was so windy and loud that night on board the rig that he couldn't hear their cries. And so so the winch just continued to reel in the wire, slowly raising Gordon closer and closer to the mouse hole. Now, Gordon could not get out of his harness unless he was on the platform below. So there was no way to escape the situation he was in. And so Gordon, after a few seconds of this not stopping and him continuing upward, he starts screaming. He's not annoyed anymore. He's terrified. And so is the crew on the main deck. They are now frantically screaming at the hoist operator to stop the winch, but nothing is working. And so one of the main deck crew members sensing that they need to do something different to get this guy's attention, he runs away from where the mouse hole is to this nearby phone. And this phone is connected up to the hoist operator station and he picks it up and it starts dialing. Up in the hoist operator station, he's still not paying attention when the phone rings. He grabs the phone, puts it to his ear and immediately he's hit with screams to stop the winch. And so the hoist operator, totally confused, whips around and hits stop on the winch, but it was too late. Just a few moments earlier, Gordon had finally been pulled all the way up right to the entrance of the underside of this mouse hole. And as he reached this hole, he tried to position himself in a vertical position so that maybe he could slip his upper body into the hole and he could just kind of slide through the hole. He'd still be hurt by it, but it would limit the damage. However, because of his harness being on his waist right in front of him, he couldn't get himself into a vertical position. He could only lay back in a horizontal one. And so when he reached the underside of the main deck and he's looking right at this mouse hole, he just put his arms and his legs out and tried to push himself back as if he could fight the winch and keep himself from going into this hole. But there was nothing he could do. And so his pelvis first was pulled into the 10 inch hole. And as his body begins to literally break in half, he's screaming out in pain. And then by the time the hoist operator had hit stop, Gordon was already deceased and only a section of his torso actually made it up through the hole. Gordon's company was found guilty of being blatantly delinquent on many safety protocols. And so they were fined 60,000 pounds and then they paid an undisclosed amount to Gordon's family. Before we get into our next story, I wanna talk about today's sponsor, Current. Current is the future of money management. It's done entirely on your phone and with a debit card, here's mine. But what they announced just last month is why they're so popular right now. They launched a program just called Interest, which is literally one of the very best savings options on the market right now. It comes with a whopping 4% APY with no special requirements, which in layman's terms means it will generate you 60 times the American national average. And at a time in America where inflation is as high as it's been in 40 years, now is a great time to jump on this offer. It's like you're signing up for free money. And if that's not incentive enough, Current and I are literally giving away free money, $10,000 to you all, so you can start to earn that sweet, sweet 4% APY. All you gotta do is sign up for Current using my code, BALLININTEREST, and then you could be one of 20 people who get 500 bucks from this promotion. Okay, back to the stories. 
In 2017, 71-year-old Bernard Gore was a retiree living in Tasmania, which is an island state of Australia. In January of that year, he and his wife of 50 years, Angela, decided to go visit their daughter who lived in Sydney, Australia. Now, they made this trip with some regularity and they developed a sort of routine for every time they visited. They would land in Sydney and then the first day they would spend it entirely with their daughter at her house. And then the next day, Angela would get up early and she would head out into town and do some shopping on her own. And then sometime in the afternoon, Bernard would head out and he would meet up with her for lunch at a very popular spot. It was called the Westfield Center Mall and they had an amazing food court. So on January 5th of that year, Bernard and Angela, they land in Sydney and like they always did, they went straight to their daughter's house and they spent the day with her. And then early the next morning, Angela got up and she headed out to do her shopping. And before she left, she confirmed with her husband that they would meet up for lunch at Westfield Center Mall. Now, as it happened that day, Angela actually chose to do her shopping at Westfield Center Mall. And so she was there around lunchtime when she was supposed to meet Bernard. And so when she looked at her watch and she realized it was time to meet him, she just simply stepped out of the shop she was in and headed over to the food court. And when she got there, she found their meeting spot. It was in front of one of their favorite restaurants and she sat down and then she scanned around looking for her husband, but inside of this busy food court, she couldn't see him. And so she looked at her watch again and she realized she was a couple of minutes early and so she grabbed a menu and she began looking for what she was going to order while she waited for him to show up. But 15 minutes would go by and Bernard would not show up and so now he was late. And so Angela at this point she pulls her phone out and she tries calling her husband but he didn't answer. However, that was kind of common for Bernard so not necessarily a red flag. Angela would continue to try calling her husband for the next several minutes and each time he would not answer. And so eventually Angela just gets frustrated and she's thinking to herself you know, maybe he just got sidetracked and he's walking around the mall somewhere because Bernard was known for being a big window shopper. And as soon as Angela thought that, she was like, that's got to be it. And it was so frustrating for her that he had just totally blown off their lunch date. And so she stands up, she abandons her table, she's totally annoyed, and she heads out into the main shopping area to go find her husband. And so she's walking along, looking in each of the windows, expecting to see her husband. And at the same time, she's looking over her shoulder back towards the food court to see if maybe Bernard had shown up. But after 30 minutes of wandering around kind of right near the food court and not seeing him anywhere, Angela thinks to herself, you know what? I I bet he thought we were supposed to meet at our daughter's house first. And so he probably hasn't even left the house yet. I bet he's just there waiting for me. And so Angela, when she realizes this, she stops looking for him in the mall. She turns around and she begins walking towards the mall exit. But before she reaches the exit door, a terrifying thought crosses her mind. What if Bernard got confused and has no idea where he is right now? A recent unfortunate development for Bernard was that he was showing early signs of dementia. It hadn't fully taken a hold of him yet, but he was clearly starting to forget things that he shouldn't. And so as soon as Angela thought of this, she went from being annoyed with her husband to being very worried about her husband. And so she sped through those doors outside and speed walked all the way back to her daughter's house, which was not far from the mall. And the whole time she's walking, she's telling herself she's going to walk inside and she's going to see Bernard. He's going to be in the house. But when she got to the house and went inside and saw her daughter, her daughter said, no, dad left about two hours ago to go meet you. I haven't seen or heard from him since. Now, of course, both of them were extremely worried for Bernard, but they decided to just stay calm that the best thing they could do right now would just be to stay put, stay at their daughter's house and wait for Bernard to eventually come back because the only other logical place he would go would be his daughter's house. And so they sat at the house, just kind of waiting, looking at the door, waiting for him to come in. But he didn't. And by 8 p.m., six hours after anybody had last seen Bernard, he still had not shown up. They couldn't get in touch with him. And so Angela called the police and reported him missing. Immediately, the police contacted the Westfield Center Mall security team and said, hey, you know, we're looking for this guy. And they went right down to the food court where Bernard and Angela had said they were going to meet. And the mall security team walked all around and they walked into all the nearby shops and kind of scanned the immediate vicinity near their meeting spot but they reported back to police that there was no sign of Bernard. And they would also tell police that after reviewing their camera footage, and this mall had hundreds of cameras covering every angle, 
inside and out. I mean, everything is covered. They would tell police, you know, after reviewing the footage, we didn't see Bernard enter or exit the mall at any point today. He was not here. And so the police, they take this information and they go back to Angela that night and they say, hey, look, you know, we talked to the mall and based on their security footage, they have no record of Bernard ever being in the mall. Do you have any idea where he could have gone? And Angela would say, no, the only places would have been the mall or maybe at our daughter's house. This is also when Angela explained to police that her husband had early signs of dementia and so it was possible that he might have just gotten confused and he could be out on the street somewhere. But she assured the police that her husband, whenever this happened, whenever he got confused, he would just sit down and he would try to ask for help from anybody passing by or he would just sit where he was and he would wait for his family to come find him. And so with this knowledge, the police went back out and they widened their search and they began looking in all the areas that were within walking distance of the Westfield Center Mall. At the same time, Angela and her daughter began trying to retrace Bernard's footsteps from the daughter's home in the direction of the Westfield Center Mall to see if maybe there was something obvious along the route that might have sidetracked him and kind of led him astray and that maybe he'd be somewhere else in those directions. But as they were walking around, there really was nothing that stood out to them. And then eventually it just got too dark out and they had to just turn it in and go back to their house and hope that the next morning when they got up, the police would have found Bernard and that he was okay. But but the next morning when they got up, the police had not found Bernard. There was no sign of him. There was no clues, nothing. And unfortunately, over the next several weeks, there was no sign of Bernard. Nobody knew what happened to him. On January 27th, so three weeks after Bernard had gone missing, a maintenance worker at the Westfield Center Mall was walking down the staff-only passageway. It was basically like this tunnel with no windows, all concrete. They kind of looped around the outside of the mall to help workers get to and from certain locations in the building. He's walking down this passageway when he looks down this one hallway that was very rarely used and he sees at the end of it, barely lit up from the lights inside, there looks to be some equipment kind of propped up against the wall. And he's thinking to himself, there's no reason someone would leave their equipment at the end of this very rarely used hallway. It didn't make any sense. And so he decided to walk down and see whose equipment it was. And so he's making his way down and he's getting closer and closer and he still can't quite figure out what it is. The lighting's not great. But when he gets close enough to see what it is, he stops where he is, he turns around and he runs back down the hallway. He finds the nearest exit he goes outside and he calls the police. Back on January 6th, on the day that Bernard and Angela were supposed to meet up for lunch, Bernard did leave his daughter's house and he walked straight to the mall and he got there. He arrived at the Westfield Center Mall and was picked up on camera walking into their food court. But the staff at the mall who reviewed the footage for police, they only looked at a handful of cameras. There's hundreds of cameras. They only looked at a couple, and so they missed this crucial footage of Bernard. And what the footage would have shown them was Bernard making his way into the food court ahead of Angela. Angela's nowhere to be found. And Bernard, instead of sitting down at their meeting spot in front of this restaurant, Bernard suddenly looks like he's confused, and he turns and he walks to this emergency exit door. He presses it in, he steps inside, and the door shuts behind him. Now, the Westfield Center Mall is not your average mall. It is massive. There are six floors to it, nearly 300 shops and restaurants. But what truly makes it massive is something that the public doesn't usually see. And that is behind staff-only doors and emergency exit doors like the one Bernard had just gone through are nearly eight miles of windowless, concrete, narrow stairwells and tunnels that loop all around the outside of the building. And once Bernard had gone through that emergency exit door and that door had shut and locked behind him, the only way for him to return to the food court and meet his wife would be if he completely exited the mall and looped all the way back around. But in order to exit the mall from where he just entered, he would need to go to a very specific exterior fire exit door that was several floors below him, and to get to it required following this very confusing signage on the walls. And so if you did it correctly, you would basically go down the hallway, find this particular 
another stairwell, you'd go down a couple of levels, and then at some point, without really any signage, you would get to the appropriate floor, and you'd go down the hallway into this maze of more hallways, and then finally you'd reach this kind of nondescript exit door, and that would be your exit. Finding your way from where Bernard entered all the way to the exit of the mall would be challenging for someone thinking clearly, and clearly Bernard was not. Bernard was confused and likely really didn't understand where he was or what he was doing or why he was there, and so he did not follow these directions. Instead, he just began wandering down the hallway, and he would have immediately passed the one stairwell that would have very circuitously brought him down but out of the building. He passed that stairwell, and he just kept on walking, and eventually he walked into this staff-only area, which was even more confusing because there was no signs telling him where to go, and virtually every door he encountered would have been locked. And so as Bernard wandered through this concrete maze and got more and more mixed up and confused, he most likely began yelling out for help. But his sound could not have penetrated the walls, which means the only people who could have heard his cries would have been people inside the hallway with him. And unfortunately, this section of tunnels that Bernard had found himself in was rarely, if ever, used by any of the staff. And to make matters worse, the mall security guards were supposed to come in and do regular checks of all these eight miles of tunnels and stairwells specifically to see if people got lost in them. But over time, the security guards kind of stopped doing that. And there were no security cameras inside of this particular segment of tunnels that Bernard found himself in and there was no cell phone reception, so had he tried calling anyone, it wouldn't have worked. And so truly, Bernard was on his own. And so after several hours or days of Bernard aimlessly wandering around this maze, hitting dead end after dead end and reaching locked door after locked door, Bernard at some point turned a corner and looked down at the end of a hallway, and he saw there was a chair up against the side of the wall. And like he was programmed to do any time he got confused, he rushed over to it and he sat down and he began waiting for a passerby to help him or his family to find him. But unfortunately, help never came, and he would eventually pass away on that chair. On January 27th, that maintenance worker, he discovered Bernard's body. Following his death, the Westfield Center Mall came out and said they made drastic changes to their security system and how they track people while they're on their property. In 2007, 60-year-old Michael Dick was living in Bow, East London with his wife and two daughters. While his life was not exactly exciting, it was good. He lived in a quiet and safe neighborhood, and Michael, who used to be a carpenter, was now semi-retired and got to spend the bulk of his time with his friends and family. But that year, something really started to bother him. Ten years prior, Michael had split up with his first wife, and after their divorce was finalized, his ex-wife and the daughter they had together, her name was Lisa and she was 21 at the time, those two stayed in the family home in Sudbury, England, and Michael moved south about an hour and a half to Bow, East London. The divorce had been quite messy, and so Michael had not only lost touch with his ex-wife, he had also lost touch with Lisa. And so fast forward 10 years back to 2007, and Michael and Lisa had not spoken since the divorce, and Michael found himself suddenly feeling this unbelievable wave of grief over the loss of his relationship with his first child. And so after speaking with his current wife and his two other daughters, he decided that he had to go find Lisa. He had to be reunited with her. The only problem was he didn't know where Lisa lived, he didn't have her contact information, and he didn't know where his ex-wife Wife was, so he couldn't even ask her how to get in touch with Lisa. However, he did have the street address of where they used to live in Sudbury, England, and so he decided that would be his starting point. So in August of that year, Michael and his two other younger daughters, they hopped in the car and they left Bow, East London, and they headed up to Sudbury, and when they got there, Michael navigated to his old street, which had brick houses lining each side of the road, and he drove down until he spotted his old house, and he parked right out front, and then he alone hopped out of the car and he walked up to the front door. He took a deep breath and then he knocked on the door. 
When the door opened, it was not Lisa, it was not his ex-wife, it was some other family that he didn't know, and they didn't know Lisa or his ex-wife, and so they said, you know, good luck finding your daughter, but we don't have any information for you. And so Michael was crushed, but he thanked them, and he turned around, and he went back to the car, and he told his other daughters about what he had just learned. And then from there, the trio just kind of began driving around Sudbury, half looking for Lisa out on the streets, although none of them thought they would actually find her, and then also kind of discussing what they were going to do next because now they had nothing. And so as they're driving around the streets of Sudbury, they come to the realization that their best bet at finding Lisa is putting some sort of story in the local newspaper that hopefully she would see and then she would contact Michael. And so they drove to the headquarters of the local paper, the Suffolk Free Press, and they went inside and they managed to speak to a reporter. And after telling the reporter Michael's story about how he's lost touch with Lisa, the reporter thought, you know what, this is actually a pretty interesting story and I'd be happy to do a small feature on you guys. And so the reporter, along with a photographer, brought Michael and his two daughters outside. They took a picture of them and then they told Michael, you know, in the next edition of the paper that will run in a couple of days, we'll run this picture along with a little write-up about how you're looking for Lisa and we'll put your contact information in there and hopefully she sees it and she reaches out to you and you can be reunited and live happily ever after. And so Michael thanked the reporter and the photographer and then he and his other two daughters hopped in the car and headed back to Bow, East London. In 2007, at the same time that Michael was beginning his search for Lisa, Lisa was actually beginning to think, you know what, I want to go find my dad. Lisa was now 31 years old. She had three kids of her own. She was married. She had moved out of Sudbury to a neighboring town. And she was thinking, you know, I really want to have a relationship with my dad again so that my kids can have a relationship with him. And so she began speaking with her mother and with friends about how she should go about finding her dad. Because like Michael, she didn't have his contact information. She didn't have a phone number. She didn't know anyone who would. And then when she went on social media to look for him, he wasn't on there. And so she was kind of at a loss. Then one day in August, she was at her office and she was in the break room and she saw a copy of the Suffolk Free Press sitting out on the coffee table. So she picked it up and she began flipping through the pages. And then suddenly she stopped when she saw a picture of herself. She saw her and her mother walking along the streets of Sudbury. She had been in Sudbury just a couple of days ago to talk to her mom about finding her dad and kind of strategies for how to go about doing that. And then Lisa glanced at the caption for this photo and she nearly fell off of her chair. The man and the two girls who were the main focus of this photo that Lisa was in were her father and her two stepsisters. She just didn't recognize them. She just saw herself in the back of this photo. So purely by chance, after being apart for over a decade, on the only day that Lisa happened to be in Sudbury, talking to her mom about finding her father, she was literally 100 feet behind her father and her stepsisters as they were looking for her and putting out this ad in the paper to hopefully find her. And this one photo that the photographer took captured all of them in the same frame. Lisa would, of course, read the article and get her father's contact information. She would reach out, and initially, Michael actually thought it was a scam and didn't believe this was actually Lisa calling to say, I found myself in the picture of you in Sudbury. But eventually, he was convinced, and he drove right out to Sudbury, and he got a chance to meet his grandkids for the first time. And today, he and Lisa are still in touch. Before we get into our next story, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. One of the hardest things about struggling with your mental health is that oftentimes you don't actually know you're struggling with your mental health. Before I became Mr. Ballin on the internet, I struggled mightily with depression. However, had you asked me at the time how I felt, I would have just thought I had a bad temper, not realizing that my bad temper was a symptom of deeper issues. Luckily, I was able to go outside of my comfort zone and seek out a th therapist, and with their help, I was able to change my outlook on life and become a happy person again. Because therapy has had such a positive impact on my life, I recently partnered with BetterHelp, which is a very highly reviewed online therapy platform that I currently use, and I think it's totally awesome. And so far, the people from our strange, dark, and mysterious community who have also given BetterHelp a shot, they've given us permission to share some of their feedback, and as you can see, it's very positive. BetterHelp is super easy to sign up for 
for and use. You just fill out a questionnaire that assesses your specific needs, and then within 48 hours, you are matched up with your therapist. Then you schedule secure video and phone sessions, plus you can exchange unlimited messages, and anything you share is totally confidential. Also, you can change your therapist at any time for no additional cost. So if you are even considering trying out therapy, I highly recommend BetterHelp as your starting point. If you're interested, make sure you go to betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin, that is betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin to get 10% off your first month. Okay, let's get back to the stories. If I told you to picture the Amazon rainforest in your head, you would likely picture a dense tropical wilderness full of amazing and exotic animals. And you'd be right, that is a good representation of the Amazon rainforest. But what a lot of people don't know is that the Amazon rainforest is also home to a massive city. It's called Manaus, and it sits right in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, right along the Amazon River. And it happens to be one of the most violent places in the entire world. All it takes in Manaus is simply walking down the wrong street or crossing the wrong person, and you can get shot or stabbed in broad daylight, and there's virtually nothing anyone can do to stop it. In 1989, a 31-year-old former police officer named Wallace Souza decided to make a TV show about what it was actually like to live in his hometown of Manaus. And unlike other crime shows in Brazil that often censored out the most graphic content they covered, Wallace decided he wasn't going to do that. He wanted to expose the harsh reality of life in Manaus, and he felt like the only way to do that was to show everything. And so that year, he launched this show, which he called Canal Livre, which translates roughly to free channel. And true to form, there was no filter on what went on the air. And so this show was shocking. Viewers were given a front row seat to freshly murdered victims that are lying out in the road and slumped over chairs in restaurants and behind steering wheels. And the cameraman would zoom in on their fatal injuries and they would zoom in on the faces of these people that have just died. Every gratuitous detail, every blood spatter, every grieving family member of the victim who's crying out in pain, all of it was shown on this TV show. And then in between these very dark and violent segments about gang killings and drug deals going wrong, Canal Livre also had a much lighter side. They would bring on local artists to talk about what they're working on, to maybe try to sell some of their goods. The show would also focus on down on their luck families that needed help raising some money. And so the show was designed to get people to donate. And then also for really no reason at all, there was a segment on the show where this puppet character would get into a fight with a man selling bread. It was a totally bizarre and shocking spectacle, and the people of Manaus loved it. And then eventually, the people of Brazil loved it. I mean, this was an extremely popular show. Because Wallace was often on camera on Canal Livre, he became very famous and very recognizable. And so when he would walk around Manaus, people would see him and literally just start clapping and cheering for him. And as he and his show became more and more popular across South America, Wallace decided he didn't just want to report on crime, he wanted to fight crime. So on air, Wallace began berating the government for not being able to protect its citizens, and he berated the police for not being able to catch the criminals. And then off the air, Wallace campaigned for and was elected to political office in Manaus, where he continued to push hard to reduce crime in the city. And so it wasn't long before Wallace went from just being a relatively well-known TV host to being one of the most beloved and influential and trustworthy people in all of Brazil. However, over the years, there was one strange thing about his show, Canal Livre, that people just couldn't wrap their heads around. This oddity was most obvious in a now famous episode of Canal Livre that aired sometime in the mid-2000s. This episode opens with a Canal Livre reporter making their way through a jungle, and there's a cameraman filming them from behind, and this reporter, they're very carefully walking through, kind of pushing branches out of the way and high-stepping over all the underbrush, and then at some point, up ahead, you see there is a clearing and there is a third person standing in this clearing and they're clearly looking straight down at something on the ground that we can't see. But this third person is very occupied with whatever is on the ground. And so eventually this reporter makes their way through the jungle into this clearing and then as soon as the cameraman gets 
gets into the clearing as well, he looks down at what is on the ground. And what you see is what appears to be a log that has previously been lit on fire because it's still smoking and it's black and it's charred. But as the cameraman zooms in, you see there are hands on this log. So you realize it's not a log, it's a human being who's obviously deceased. And based on how badly charred they are and how much they're still smoking, you realize very quickly that this person must have been on fire very recently, as recently as probably just a couple of minutes ago. Like right before the camera got here, this person was on fire. And so as you're kind of seeing this shocking image, the reporter suddenly talks about this person like he knows all the details of them already. He says, you know, this person, you know, it's a man and they were not shot to death. They were doused with gasoline and burned alive. But at this point, the police had not come out. They had not seen this dead person yet. And so it made no sense that the reporter would have all this information on hand because no one knows this stuff yet. And based on just looking at this person's body, it was too badly burned to be able to tell whether it was a man or whether they had been shot or not or whether gasoline was used. But when Wallace was questioned about where he and his reporters got their information from, he just said, look, you know, we're a very popular show and people call us often before they call the police and they give us information about what's happening in the city. And we have a huge team. We watch the police headquarters. We listen to the police's radio. We watch the morgue. We have loads of informants all over the city. And so we just get our information really, really quickly. And this answer was enough until 2008. That year, in October, the police arrested a former Manaus police officer who just went by the name Moa, and they accused him of nine murders. And so they throw him in jail. But Moa, despite the seriousness of the charges against him, seems totally unfazed. It was obvious he had some sort of powerful connection outside of prison, some person or some entity that he fully expected was going to, at any moment, swoop in and magically get him out of prison. But that didn't happen. Moa just continued to sit in jail, and at some point that began to sink in that he was kind of on his own, and so he began to talk. And the story he would tell would shock Brazil. Moa would admit to having killed some people, but he would tell police, look, I'm just the assassin. The person who hired me for these killings is Wallace Souza. It would turn out Wallace Souza started his show, Canal Livre, with the best of intentions. But when his show became massively popular and it in turn made him, Wallace, also massively popular and powerful, he became corrupt. And at some point after his meteoric rise, he formed this very powerful drug cartel. And then in an effort to bolster his illegal dealings and to boost his show's ratings, he decided to start contracting hitmen like Moa to start taking out rival gang members in Manaus. And he would tell the hitman how he wanted them killed and where he wanted them killed and at what time. And then after the hitman agreed to do this, he, Wallace, would go tell his camera crews exactly where to go and at what time so that they would be arriving at the murder scene literally right as it was happening or right afterwards, allowing them the opportunity to get all the gold footage before anybody else. It would take the police a year to finally compile enough evidence to charge Wallace with murder, but they would do it in October of 2009, and eventually Wallace would turn himself in. However, he denied everything. And then before he went to trial, he would die of a heart attack in prison. And so we never actually got to learn the full extent of what exactly Wallace Souza had done, how many people he had had assassinated, and how many of them were shown on his TV show. But we do know that at least three of his assassination victims were shown on his TV show, one of them being the person that was found out in the jungle. They really were a man. They really had not been shot. They had been burned alive with gasoline at Wallace's discretion. But in the end, the person who paid the highest price for the Canal Livre killings was Moa, the hitman who blew the whistle on what was going on with the show. On New Year's Day in 2017, a crime syndicate overran the prison where Moa was being held. Now, they had lots of targets of people they were going there to kill, and one of them was Moa. They were furious with him that he spoke to police and gave up information about the drug trade in Brazil. And so eventually, this angry mob of gangsters made their way over to Moa's cell, and when they found him, he was pressed up against the back of his cell wall, basically as far away from the bars as he possibly could be, and he began 
pleading for his life, and this horde was not having it. They were only there to kill him. And so they all have machetes and knives, and they're looking at him through the bars, and they say, you know, we're going to come in there, we're going to cut you to pieces. And so then they start banging on the door, they're trying to hack the lock open, and Moa, he can't do anything. All he can do is kind of just keep himself all the way to the back of the cell and hope they don't get in. And eventually, they can't open the door, and they know it. And so they do the next best thing. They reach through the bars with a lighter and they light Moa's mattress on fire. And so Moa was trapped. He had nowhere to go. And so eventually the fire reached him and he burned alive. In 2010, 18-year-old Renee Marsden was living in Sydney, Australia with her parents and her three siblings. Renee was a very outgoing person who had a big circle of friends, and she was also very close with her family, especially her mom, Teresa. Teresa had given birth to Renee when she was only 19 years old, and so now that Renee was a young woman, because of their closeness in ages, the two had become very close friends instead of mother and daughter. And so because of that dynamic, Renee found herself always going to her mother to tell her anything going on in her life. She was her confidant. And that year, something major had disrupted Renee's life, and so naturally she went to her mom and she told her about it. It would turn out Renee's boyfriend of nearly two years, who she was madly in love with, well, she discovered he was cheating on her and didn't actually even care about her. He had sent these text messages that basically said as much. And so she confronted her boyfriend with these text messages, and he denied ever sending them. He said, look, I've never cheated on you. I don't know where those came from. I promise I've been faithful to you this entire time. But Renee Renee just wasn't buying it, and so she had felt forced to break up with him. And so Renee naturally had turned to her mother for comfort and guidance, but Teresa, all she could really offer her daughter was, you know, to remind her that time heals all wounds, and that certainly someday you will meet the right person for you. And amazingly, only a couple of weeks after this very painful breakup, Renee came home from work one day, and she walked into the house, and she was all smiles. And considering how unbelievably depressed she had been over the last couple couple of weeks, I mean, this really stood out. And so when her mom saw her smiling and radiating happiness, she rushed over to her and said, you know, what's gotten into you? Why are you in such a good mood? And Renee would tell her that actually I've met another guy. And so Teresa said, who? Who did you meet? Who is this person? And she would tell her mom that his name is Braden Spiteri. He was 23 years old and he was a graduate of the King's School, which is a really prestigious boys school in Sydney. And his father was this really successful business person who owned this big construction company that he was set to inherit later on. And so she was just raving about how amazing this guy was. And Teresa was really happy. If nothing else, this was a very good distraction for her. And so she asked her daughter at some point, you know, how'd you meet this guy? And Renee would tell her that Camilla had introduced them. Camilla Zidane was Renee's best friend they had met in high school. And Renee would explain to her mother that Brayden was actually Camilla's ex-boyfriend, but they hadn't dated in a really long time and there was no feelings between them. They were just friends at this point. And apparently, you know, after Renee had this really painful breakup, Camilla had just felt bad for her. And so she had gone out and found the best possible match for Renee, which in her mind was this guy, Brayden. Teresa knew Camilla really well because she was always over the house and she knew Knew Teresa's intentions must have been good, but she's thinking to herself, this is bad news. You don't want to have best friends, one dating the ex-boyfriend of the other. It's just bad news waiting to happen. And so Teresa couldn't even help herself. And she says to her daughter, do you really think it's a good idea to be dating Camilla's ex-boyfriend? But Renee would tell her mom, look, Camilla was totally upfront with me. She just wants me to be happy. She thinks Brayden is a good match for me. They don't have feelings anymore. Not at all. She's totally in support. And so Teresa still very much had her doubts that this was a good idea. But she put those doubts aside, and instead she said, okay, well, can you show me a picture of Brayden? Can I see what he looks like? And so Renee pulls out her phone, and she finds a picture of Brayden, and she shows it to her mom. And right away, her mom is looking at this picture and seeing that Brayden is a very handsome guy, big, bright smile. But she sees in this picture, Camilla is very clearly laying on his shoulder like she is his girlfriend. And so again, Teresa's thinking to herself, this is not good. Someone is going to get hurt. 
But over the next couple of weeks and months, Renee and Brayden texted each other all the time. I mean, Renee had her phone out basically 24 seven talking to Brayden. The pair had made plans to meet up and see each other in person for the first time on several different occasions, but every single time they were set to go meet, one of them would have a conflict that would make it impossible to have this face-to-face -face meeting. And so before long, when they just could not get a meeting established, they kind of stopped trying to have face-to-face -face meetings. It was almost like they had built this really strong, flourishing relationship all via their phones, and it just was getting more and more awkward to actually go out and see each other in real life. It was just more comfortable doing it all on their phones. And so this digital only relationship between Renee and Brayden continued for almost a year until January of 2012 when something horrible happened. Brayden was in a horrible motorcycle accident he survived the accident, but his passenger, his best friend, this guy named Richie, who was riding right on the back of his motorcycle, he didn't survive. He was killed in the accident. And it was determined that Braden was driving recklessly. And so he was charged with manslaughter and convicted and sentenced to two years in prison. Even though Renee's mother, Teresa, was totally upset about this accident. I mean, she did understand someone had lost their life and now Braden was going to jail for two years. She understood the seriousness of this accident. But at the same time, there was a part of her, her motherly protective side of her, that was kind of relieved for her daughter. She figured with Brayden being out of contact for two years in prison, that their relationship would end and Renee could go pursue somebody else who was not an ex-boyfriend of a close friend and was someone that she could actually see in person and not just have to text with all the time. But surprisingly, after Brayden was transferred to Goldburn Prison, which is where he'd be serving his two-year sentence, Sentence. It's located about two hours to the south of Sydney. His family smuggled a phone somehow into this jail and he was able to continue texting with Renee. And so after he was incarcerated, they just picked up their relationship like nothing had changed. Now, Renee's family did not like this development and they told her as much. They thought this was a bad idea, that this was the wrong path for her, but Renee didn't care. She was totally in love. And in fact, over the first couple of weeks that he was in Goldburn prison, their relationship relationship only intensified. They actually agreed to get married as soon as he was released at the end of 2013. And in fact, Renee had already begun making wedding preparations. She had gone on eBay and found this beautiful tiara she would wear on her wedding day. And she had contracted a wedding photographer. And she had even contacted the Greek consulate to ask if it would be okay if Brayden were allowed to enter their country because they were planning to have their honeymoon in Greece and Brayden was going to be a convicted felon. And so she needed permission for him. But in August of 2013, just two months before Braden's expected release date, something changed. Renee's mother, Teresa, got a text message from Braden, something she had never gotten before, and it said, you need to check on your daughter. She's talking about killing herself. And so Teresa is totally taken aback by this message, and she goes right into Renee's bedroom where she is sitting on her bed, and her mother sits down next to her and says, honey, are you okay? You know, what's going on? And Renee would look up at her mom and say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm fine. What's going on with you? And then Teresa would hold out the phone and show her the text message from Brayden. And as soon as Renee saw it, she kind of sighed and looked at her mom and said, I'm not going to hurt myself. We just broke up. Our relationship is over. Teresa knew this was going to be an extremely hard stretch of time for her daughter with another painful breakup here. But at the same time, Teresa thought to herself, this is probably for the best. That relationship just had bad news written all over it from the start. And so now she can begin to heal and move forward with her life. And so Teresa and Renee would sit in the room for a while, just chatting on the bed. And then eventually Renee would tell her mom that her plans that night were to go out with her friends and cut loose and kind of just forget about this whole thing. And so Teresa sat in her bedroom on her bed as her daughter stood in front of the mirror and got ready. And then once Renee was ready, she and her mom hugged and kissed. And then Renee told her mom, she'd be back soon, and then she left the house. A few hours later, Teresa received a text message from her daughter, and it started with, Mom, I love you so much, and I'm sorry for the pain I'm about to cause you. You can still talk to me, though. Just call out my name, and I'll be there. Teresa read this message and didn't really know what to make of it. She knew her daughter was almost certainly very upset about this breakup, but she didn't really understand the context of this message, and so she called her daughter. She didn't pick up, so she called her again, and after that second time, her 
daughter didn't answer, she sent her a text message that just said, please call me back. But she sat there kind of waiting for her daughter's call, but it never came. And so Teresa, starting to feel a little bit worried about her daughter, she called Camilla and she asked her, you know, hey, have you talked to Renee tonight? Because I can't get in touch with her. And Camilla would tell Teresa that actually, yeah, I just got a very strange text message from her that just said, I love you, I'm sorry. And so at this point, the two women understood that there could be something very wrong with Renee. And so they met up and drove all around Sydney, going to all the places that Renee was known to go to. But after several hours of looking and not hearing back from Renee, they really didn't know what to do. And so the two women drove back to Teresa's house, so Renee's house, and they went inside and they sat down. And at that point, Teresa's husband and the rest of Renee's siblings, they were all there. And everyone's just kind of sitting around wondering what to do next when around 9, 9 30 at night they heard a knock on the door and it was the police coming to inform them that they had found Renee's car parked in an area that it shouldn't have been but Renee wasn't there and so they were coming to ask if they knew where she was and why her car might be out there and so at this point the family is totally terrified they tell the police about these strange text messages and then before long the parents just rush outside they hop in their cars and they drive out to where their daughter's car is and where Renee's car was parked was in an area called called The Gap. It basically was this sheer cliff overlooking the ocean. The parents got out and they searched their daughter's car, but there was no sign of where she had gone based on the car. And so they began running up and down the cliffs. There was a sidewalk that kind of ran parallel to the edge of the cliff. And they're running up and down, hoping they're going to find their daughter, but there's no sign of her. And then at some point, Teresa climbed up to one of the highest points of the cliff. And when she got up there, she found her daughter's black flat shoes. And they were placed neatly together on the ground right in front of the fence that was there to prevent people from getting too close to the edge of the cliff. But despite an extensive search that night, they couldn't find any sign of Renee. She was nowhere to be found. However, the police would discover the following day that there was actually a camera that was looking at that section of the cliffs. And so they reviewed this footage and they found Renee. They saw what happened to her. And in this camera footage, you see Renee walking up the trail in the middle of the night and she stops and she takes off her shoes and she puts them down and then she hops over that fence. Now, the fence was not right up against the very edge of the cliff. It was set back maybe three or four feet. And so she hops over the fence and then she steps very carefully to the edge of the cliff and she kind of peeks over the edge and then looks visibly terrified and she moves backwards a few steps until her back is pressed up against the fence. And then she pulls out her phone and she sends three text messages. One was to her mother, which is the text about how she loved her and she was sorry for the pain she was going to cause her. And then the other two text messages were to Camilla and also to Brayden. However, to this day, we don't actually know what either of those text messages said. And then after sending these three text messages, Renee takes her phone and she throws it off the cliff into the water. And then she sat down and began kind of shimmying herself forward towards the edge. Now, the camera did not actually pick her up falling off the cliff, but it's assumed when she went out of frame that she had fallen off the cliff to her death. Her body would never be recovered. Renee's death was ruled a suicide. However, her family, in addition to being totally devastated by this horrible loss, they felt totally confused. They had no idea why this had happened, but they were certain it had to have something to do with this recent breakup with Brayden Spiteri. And so they tried to get in touch with Brayden, but he wasn't getting back in touch with them. And so the family contacted the police and said, can you reach out to the prison where he is and set up a meeting? And so the police obliged them and they called Goldburn Prison. And when they spoke to the prison, they said, who? Braden who? Yeah, we don't have a Braden Spiteri here. We never have. And the reason was, Braden Spiteri wasn't real. Renee's friend, Camilla, had made him up. He was a fictitious person. That picture of Braden Spiteri where Camilla is laying on his shoulder, that was just some random person she had met in a club. Camilla had always been very possessive of Renee ever since they had met in high school. And at some point, she had just decided that she wanted even more control over Renee. And so the first thing she did is she convinced Renee that her earlier boyfriend, the one she'd been dating for two years before Braden, she 
convinced Renee that he had been cheating on her the whole time. He was unfaithful, that he didn't love her. And then she had created those text messages and given them to Renee and convinced Renee that that was something he had said. And before long, Renee totally believed it. She approached her boyfriend. He denied it. But Camilla the whole time is telling Renee, he's lying to you. He's been doing this this whole time. I know he's a bad guy. And so Renee had listened to her best friend and she had severed that relationship. And then almost immediately after that, Camilla swoops into the rescue and connects Renee with this Brayden guy, Camilla's supposed ex-boyfriend, who really was just Camilla on the other side of the phone. And for nearly two years, Camilla kept this charade up and Renee completely believed this was a real person, that Brayden was her boyfriend. She loved him. And eventually in June of 2013, so two months before Renee died, she confided in Brayden, aka Camilla, that her friend Camilla was toxic and mean and controlling and she didn't want to be her friend anymore. And so Camilla, she's reading this and she's furious. And so she decides the only way to get revenge on Renee and regain control of her is to have Brayden break up with her. And so two months later on August 5th, 2013, so on the day that Renee died, she was out to lunch at around 1 p.m. with a coworker when she gets a text message from Brayden that just kind of comes out of the blue and it says, I need a break from you. Now, this is around the time that they're planning their wedding. And so Renee is totally heartbroken and she's trying to get in touch with him and call him. He's not picking up. And then fast forward to about 2.45 p.m. that afternoon, we know Renee called Goldburn Prison. It was the first time she had done that. Now, we don't know who she spoke to or what they actually talked about, but it's nearly guaranteed that she learned Braden Spiteri was not being held there. And so almost certainly she would have realized that Braden is is either not real or Brayden had been lying to her in such a huge way that the relationship could never work. And so no matter what, this chapter of her life was totally over. And so later that day when she was sitting on her bed in her bedroom and her mom came in and she asked her how she was doing, it's very likely that Renee was devastated. She was crushed and probably kind of embarrassed about how badly she had just been duped by this Brayden person, whoever that was. And so even though normally Renee would tell her mother everything. Her mother was her confidant. She loved her mother. It was like she just couldn't bring herself to discuss what was happening to her. It was just so enormous. It was so overwhelming that she hid it from her mother. And instead, she just got dressed up, said goodbye to her mom, and then she headed out to the cliffs. No charges were ever brought against Camilla because catfishing, which is exactly what she was doing, which is using a fictitious online persona to lure people into relationships, well, that's not considered a crime in Australia. And Camilla, despite being pressed by the police and Renee's family, has never taken responsibility for this and has never apologized till. One morning in early June of 2011, in the Russian city of Kazan, a 49-year-old Russian woman named Fagiliu Mukhametsanov woke up feeling nauseous. Fagiliu had recently had some health problems, and her doctors had told her that she really needed to take it easy, don't do anything that really stressed her out or made her mad, you know, basically just relax. And so, on that morning, this is exactly what Fagiliu decided to do. Instead of pushing through her nausea to go to work anyways that day, she decided she would call out from work and stay home and have some tea and try to just feel better. But a little while later, when Fagiliu was in the kitchen making tea, her husband, Fajili, he came in and asked her how she was doing. And she said, you know what? I actually feel worse. You know, my nausea has gotten worse. My chest hurts and I'm starting to sweat. I'm going to go lie down in the bedroom. But as Fagiliu walked across the kitchen to go lay down, her chest suddenly tightened tenfold and she collapsed to the ground unconscious. Fajili rushed over to her and tried to wake her up. And when he couldn't, he rushed to the phone and dialed 112, which is Russia's emergency line, and he called for an ambulance. And then when the ambulance arrived, Fagiliu was not breathing. And by the time they got her to the hospital, she was declared dead. She had died from a heart attack. Fajili, who had been married to Fagiliu, his wife, for almost 30 years, was absolutely heartbroken 
but he and his wife's religion encouraged people to have funerals within 24 hours of a loved one passing away. And so despite the fact that Vigili was basically despondent from all his grief, he pretty much immediately began calling relatives and friends and making preparations for Fagiliu's funeral, which would take place the next day. The next morning, Fajili woke up and put on his best suit, and then he joined his and his wife's family and friends at the funeral home for Fagiliu's funeral. When Fajili walked inside of the funeral home, he saw there were all these wooden chairs facing forward towards the front of the room, and at the front of the room, up on a table, was his wife's coffin, which was open and surrounded by all the flowers that Fajili had barely been able to buy with the little bit of money that he and his wife had. Fajili slowly made his way down the middle of the room to his wife's coffin, and the other people that were there saw him coming and got out of the way in respect to, you know, the husband of the deceased. And so Fajili, he walks up and he looks down at his wife, who again, you know, it's open casket so he can see her, and he was struck by her appearance. She just did not look right. Now, Fajili did not have enough money to embalm his wife, which means to preserve a dead body and make it look like it's very lifelike. And so instead, the people who worked in this funeral home had just applied heavy makeup to Fagilia's face to try to make her appear more lifelike, but it really hadn't worked. To Fajili, it didn't even look like his wife. After all, Fagiliu never even wore makeup, and so to see her with heavy eyeliner and bright red lipstick was just totally bizarre. Behind Fajili was Fajili's family and Fagiliu's relatives all assembled in the first row and they were beginning their prayers for the dead. And so Fajili, he took a few more looks at his wife and then he stepped back and joined the first row. And so as Fajili was standing there holding his mother's and brother's hand, he closed his eyes and did his best to focus on the words of the prayer instead of on the grief he was feeling for his wife. And as he was doing that, his mother, who was on his right side, suddenly broke from the words of the prayer and let out this strange crying sound. And Vigili, he opened his eyes and looked over at his mother, expecting her to be collapsed on the ground from all the grief she was experiencing. But instead, he saw his mother was trembling and looking straight ahead. And so Fajili followed her gaze and what he saw at the front of the room made Fajili want to faint. His wife, Fagiliu, was now sitting straight up in her coffin. She wasn't making a sound, but she was looking out at the crowd of people with her strange makeup on her face, just staring at them with wide eyes. And for a second, everybody in the funeral home noticed this and went totally quiet, and both Fagiliu and the mourners just stared at each other. And then Fagiliu began screaming, but at first it was like she couldn't make any sound, and it was this raspy, dry yell that was coming out of her mouth, but then it built and built until it was sort of like a bellow or a roar. And when this loud, deep, guttural sound began coming out of Fagiliu's mouth, the mourners in the room began screaming too, and suddenly it was absolute chaos inside of this building. As funeral workers rushed to call emergency services, not knowing what else to do, Fajili, who also had been screaming after seeing his wife arise from the dead, he kind of snapped out of it and ran to his wife and he embraced her. And when he did, Fagiliu went from screaming to silent. And she looked up at her husband with wide, scared eyes and began crying. And then she slumped forward into Fajili's arms. At this point, Fajili's family and Fagiliu's family saw what was happening and they kind of snapped out of it too and they rushed forward and they helped Fajili lift Fagiliu out of her coffin and they laid her down on the ground. And even though she wasn't moving, her eyes were open and she was looking up at her family just absolutely terrified with all her makeup running from her tears. And then 12 minutes later, when Fagiliu finally was rushed to the hospital, she was declared dead again. It would turn out that when Fagiliu collapsed on her kitchen floor, she really did have a heart attack, but it didn't kill her. She was just unconscious and her breathing was very shallow and she wasn't moving and nobody noticed. And so when Fagiliu kind of came to and woke up inside of her coffin at her funeral, she likely was okay, you know, all things considered, she was, you know, healthy enough to be alive, but when she looked around the room and saw she was at her own funeral and sitting in her coffin, the stress of that moment had given her another heart attack. And this one had been fatal.
Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Have you ever sat down to watch one episode of a show and then you black out and wake up like three days later and you've binged the entire series? Well, that's what happened to me and old Seagull Lung with Bobo the Burmese Alley Cat. It's a touching show on Catflix about a Burmese alley cat with emphysema who does his best to growl and hiss and stand his ground at anyone or anything that passes by his alley. Admittedly, this show is pretty one-dimensional. It just focuses on that aspect of Bobo. Bobo's life. But me and Lung love it. And so when season 89 came out, me and Lung had to watch it immediately. However, when we fired up our flubber powered laptop, we saw season 89 was only available to stream on the world's most remote island, Pitcairn Island. And so with no other choices, me and I'll sing out Lung. <laughs> hopped on a blind, emotionally unstable phoenix and made the 4,400 mile journey to Pitcairn. We checked into our Pitcairn hotel and we're getting ready to feast our retinas on BBTBAC. Lungy turned to me and said, Papa, we had a net NordVPN mutanemen. Which of course in Dutch means, Dad, we should have just got NordVPN. With NordVPN's worldwide access, you can enjoy instant secure access to hundreds of streaming websites worldwide. And with their un interrupted streaming, you won't have to worry about buffering. So enjoy all that Bobo the emphysema cat right from the comfort of your home with NordVPN. Right now, you can get a two-year plan plus four additional months for free when you sign up at nordvpn.com slash mrballin. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash mrballin, or you can click the link in the description below. Okay, back to the stories. On October 15th, 2003, a newlywed couple named Tina and Gabe Watson arrived in Australia for their honeymoon. They were both 26 years old and lived in Alabama, and neither of them made very much money. Tina worked in the kids' department of a clothing store, and Gabe worked for his father at a packaging company. But Gabe's family had gifted this honeymoon trip to Australia to Gabe and Tina, and so the couple was so excited about it, and they had taken actually a whole year to plan this trip out. It was going to be the adventure of their lives. Once in Australia, the couple spent the first week in Sydney, which is one of the biggest cities in the country. They went on a river cruise, they visited the famous Sydney Opera House, and they went to see the koalas at the zoo, something Tina was very intent on doing because she loved animals. And then on October 21st, so six days into their big trip, the couple headed north to the city of Townsville, which is this beautiful beach town that's right near the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest and most famous coral reef system. This was going to be the real highlight of their trip. Gabe had grown up loving the water, and now as an adult, his passion was scuba diving. He was a trained rescue diver, and any chance he got back home in Alabama, he would go diving. As for Tina, scuba diving kind of scared her. She didn't like the idea of being underwater for extended periods of time and breathing in underwater. It just felt so foreign that she didn't like it. But she knew Gabe really wanted her to go scuba diving with him in Australia. And so 10 months earlier in January of 2003, Tina had begun taking scuba diving lessons. And then right before they headed out for this trip to Australia, Tina had gotten certified in scuba diving. So after arriving in Townsville, Gabe and Tina would spend the night in a hotel. And then early the next morning, the couple would get up and make their way down to the dock where they would board a diving boat. This boat was going to take them out into the open water right over this famous shipwreck called the Yongola where lots of people scuba dive. And this Yongola wreck is right near the Great Barrier Reef. So it's a truly amazing place to go scuba diving. When the couple actually was out on the open water, they looked around and just could not believe how stunning everything really was. The beach town at a distance was unbelievable and the water was perfectly clear blue where they could see thousands of fish shimmering and swimming all around them. Finally, the dive boat came to a stop over the area where the Yongola wreck was and Gabe and Tina began putting on their dive gear as did the other four tourists who were also on this diving trip. 
Now, Gabe and Tina were dive partners, which meant for this dive, they were instructed not to leave each other really at any point until they're back on the surface. But initially, once they and the other divers were put into the water, the entire group swam down together 100 feet to the bottom of the ocean where this shipwreck was. And at first, everything was going great. The swim down was easy. And then once they got down there, because the water was so clear and sunlight could reach them, they were able to look at each other and just really take in how spectacular this really was. But unfortunately, Gabe, he looked at his wrist at some point and noticed his dive computer, which tells you how much air you have left and what depth you're at, was malfunctioning. And so he signaled to Tina that he needed to go to the surface and get his computer fixed. And so he and Tina would swim away from the group back up to the surface. And then once on the surface, Gabe was able to talk to the dive leader on the boat and he was able to get his dive computer fixed. And then after only a couple of minutes of being back on the surface, Gabe and Tina went back under the water and began heading back down towards the rest of the group. And as Gabe and Tina approached the rest of the group, they saw they were all kind of swimming around in dive pairs around the Yungola wreck. And so Gabe and Tina, they got down there and they joined the queue and began as well moving as a pair around the wreck. Back up on the surface, the dive leader who was up in the boat was just kind of sitting there waiting for the divers to come back up when all of a sudden he noticed there was this sudden eruption of air bubbles coming up to the surface. And so he peered over the side of the boat to see what was going on. And Gabe, who had only left the surface after fixing his dive computer maybe five minutes earlier, came bombing up out of the water. And when he did, the dive leader immediately noticed that Tina was not with him. And before the dive leader could even ask Gabe what was going on, Gabe, who was obviously very panicked, he ripped off his mask and he began trying to tell the dive leader that something was wrong with his wife, that she had sunk away from him and he couldn't get to her and he needed help. And so the dive leader immediately put on a scuba tank, he jumped in the water and swam down as fast as he could to the wreck down below. And when he got there, he immediately saw Tina by herself laying on the sand on the bottom of the ocean, just totally motionless on her back. And so the dive leader, he swam over to her, he scooped her up, and he brought her all the way back to the surface. And then once on the surface, he put Tina into the boat, and then the dive leader, he climbed inside and immediately began doing CPR on Tina. And for 45 minutes, the dive leader tried to do CPR, tried everything he could to save Tina, but unfortunately, it was not enough, and Tina passed away. An autopsy would later reveal that Tina had died from something called an air embolism, which is when an air bubble gets trapped in a blood vessel and blocks it. In scuba divers, this can happen from holding your breath for too long or trying to ascend too quickly. One theory about how this could have happened to Tina was based on what Gabe said happened when he and Tina went back down to the wreck after he got his dive computer fixed. He said they got down there, everything was fine, they were swimming around like the other dive pairs, taking pictures, when Tina started to panic, kind of randomly, and she reached out for Gabe, and Gabe said she knocked his oxygen mask off his face, and so Gabe was kind of starting to panic, and he got the mask back on, at which point Tina was kind of floating away from him, and so Gabe, not really knowing what to do, said he went to the surface to get help. And so in that time frame, perhaps Tina, you know, tried to rush to the surface on her own, giving herself the air embolism, or maybe in her panic, she had held her breath, giving herself the air embolism. But it wasn't long after Tina's death was ruled an accident and the case was closed that the other four people who were on that dive with Gabe and Tina began reaching out to Tina's family. These divers had seen something very strange happen right around the time Tina died and they felt like they had to tell someone. One of these four divers would tell Tina's family that as they were swimming around the wreck, they saw Gabe and Tina come back down after Gabe had fixed his dive computer. And pretty quickly after they reached the bottom, Gabe seemed to give Tina a hug, like a really strong bear hug. Now, there's no reason any diver would hug another diver underwater, certainly not that hard, unless it was some sort of rescue attempt. And this diver who witnessed this 
told Tina's family that this did not look like a rescue attempt. It looked like Gabe was trying to restrain Tina and Tina was trying to get away from Gabe. After a few moments of watching this, the same diver would see Gabe release Tina and at that point Tina would go limp and float to the bottom and Gabe would rush to the surface where he would tell the dive leader that he had this emergency with his wife. This new information led Australian authorities to charge Gabe with murder. They alleged that Gabe intentionally turned off Tina's air and then put her in that bear hug to make sure she couldn't turn it back on again. Gabe, however, has always denied this, saying his wife really just panicked and he was trying to help her but couldn't and then went to the surface. Gabe ultimately pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter in Australia and served 18 months in prison. Prosecutors in Alabama then also tried to charge Gabe with murder or something else in connection to Tina's death, but ultimately a judge dismissed the case. One final note about this story, which also happens to be the reason most people know about this story, is that two of the four divers who were down there with Gabe and Tina were taking underwater pictures at the time that Tina died. Here is a photo they developed from this trip, which clearly shows Tina in the background just moments after Gabe had released her and she sunk to the bottom and died. In July of 1848, a 25-year-old man named Phineas Gage got a job working construction on the Hudson River Railroad in New York. At this time in America, railroads were being laid all over the country, and so lots of workers like Phineas were needed to blast rock out of the way to lay down these railroad tracks. And as it happened, Phineas was an expert in explosives. He had learned how to set controlled blasts growing up on his family's farm in New Hampshire, and then later in his life, he had worked in a mine blasting through rock. And so in addition to just being the ideal railroad worker for this time in America, when Phineas actually started working in New York on this railroad, his co-workers immediately started looking up to him. Phineas was extremely smart and energetic. He was this incredible conversationalist. He was charismatic and funny and a natural leader. And so just two months into starting this new job, it was no surprise to anyone who knew Phineas or worked with Phineas that he was promoted to blasting foreman, which meant Phineas would lead the explosives team. Phineas was so excited about this promotion that he went to a blacksmith and had a custom tamping iron made. A tamping iron is a long metal rod that's used to pack explosives. When railroad workers wanted to blast through, let's say, a big rock, they would start by drilling a deep but skinny hole in the rock, then they would pour blasting powder inside, then they'd put a fuse inside, and then using this tamping iron, they would push the blasting powder and the fuse deep into this hole inside of this rock or whatever it was they were blowing up. And then once it was packed, they would ignite it. Usually, tamping irons were sort of rough tools that looked like crowbars, but Phineas really wanted something special to commemorate this promotion. And so Phineas had the blacksmith make this perfectly straight, smooth, four foot long metal tamping iron. And on one end was a pointed side and on the other was a blunted side. And this rod, it weighed about 13 pounds and it was about an inch and a quarter in diameter. And Phineas loved this tamping iron. He brought it with him, not just to work, but basically anywhere he went. On September 3rd, 1848, so not long after Phineas's big promotion, Phineas and his explosives team were blasting through some rock that ran through a forest. And Phineas, he was right up front over the blasting site, helping them prep the explosive. His team had drilled that long, deep, skinny hole into the rock they were about to blow up. And then blasting powder was put inside, a fuse was put inside. And then Phineas took his tamping iron and began packing the powder and fuse deep into the rock. And the way he did this is he used the blunt end of his tamping iron to pack the explosives, which meant the pointed end was sticking out of the rock. And so as Phineas is doing this, someone behind him slipped on a rock. One of his men tripped or something. And so Phineas, with his hands kind of on his tamping iron, turned to the right to look and see what was going on. 
And when he did this, somehow his tamping iron that was inside of this skinny hole must have nudged against the inside of the rock, created a spark, and ignited the explosive inside of the rock, which meant the tamping iron was basically fired like a missile out of this hole into Phineas's head. It went in his cheek, up behind his left eye, up and out of his skull, and then shot 80 feet away, landing on the ground, covered in Phineas's blood and brains. This happened so quickly that for a second, after this thing has blown through Phineas's head, Phineas just stood there upright with his eyes wide, and then suddenly a geyser of blood began shooting out of the top of his head, and then Phineas fell backwards onto the ground. When Phineas's body hit the ground, he began having a seizure, at which point his co-workers, who were still kind of shaken up from this sudden blast, they rushed over and tried to kind of position him in a way that he wouldn't hurt himself. But I mean, they're looking at him and he's literally missing half of his head. He's covered in blood. And they're thinking, you know, there's nothing we could do for him, but basically wait for him to die. And so all of Phineas's co-workers who adored Phineas just stood there very somber watching their boss die. But eventually Phineas stopped having a seizure and then he opened his eyes and he looked up at his crew and he sat up and he said, what happened? Now remember, half of his head has been blown out by a 13 pound, four foot long metal rod that has shot through his head. And his coworkers, when they heard how clearly he was speaking and how focused his eyes were, I mean, they couldn't believe it. How in the world is this guy alive, let alone having a coherent conversation with them? And so the coworkers told Phineas, please lie down, we'll get you help, lie down, relax. But Phineas, who still had blood also shooting out of his head, just kind of stood up casually and walked over to the railroad cart and signaled for his crew to take him back into town. And so the crew, they're looking over at Phineas, who now is literally head to toe, just red from blood, still bleeding, but less so. And he's just sitting on the railroad cart waiting for them. And so they walk over to him and they start the slow one mile journey into town on this railroad cart. And the whole time they're all kind of looking at Phineas, expecting him to die any second. But instead, Phineas is just kind of looking around with half of his head. And at some point he pulled out his logbook and carefully wrote down what time they were leaving their work site to make sure his crew was accurately paid. And then finally they reached town and Phineas was still very much alive and looking around, acting like nothing had happened to him. And the co-workers helped him to his hotel and Phineas just sat outside on a chair in front of his hotel, just people watching while his crew went and got a doctor. A doctor soon arrived and he too was completely shocked at Phineas's appearance, but even more so was Phineas's eyes. He looked at the doctor and his eyes were totally focused, like he was all there, totally lucid, looking at the doctor, waiting for him to come over and help him out with his little injury. And when the doctor kind of timidly approached Phineas, Phineas very famously said as he sat on his chair, Doctor, here's business enough for you. Like everyone else, the doctor fully assumed that despite Phineas's miraculous recovery from this injury, that he would soon die from this horrific wound in his head. And so the doctor moved Phineas up into the hotel, put him in a bed, and then basically made him comfortable. Now, the doctor at this point was not trying to save Phineas. He felt like there was nothing he could do to save Phineas. At this point, it was like mercy. Let's make this as pain-free as possible for Phineas as he inevitably dies from this injury. But Phineas didn't die. He would break out of it and basically be okay again. However, his personality at first, after he came out of this state of delirium, was not really the same. No longer was he this funny, smart, charming, confident leader. Instead, he was this guy who seemed to have lost all of his inhibitions and was kind of childlike. He swore all the time. He would tell people he had these crazy plans he was going to go do, but he would never follow through with them. And he would tell his nieces and nephews these wild stories about himself that were obviously made up and not even close to reality. But overall, he was okay, even though you could see his brain pulsing underneath his skin on the side of his head that had been blown off. And within a couple of years of this injury, those changes to Phineas's personality kind of faded, and he really did become old Phineas. However, there was one unique quirk to Phineas post-injury that never went away. 
and that was Phineas's kind of unhealthy love for the tamping iron that had blown through his head. After his injury, Phineas kind of stopped making friends, and any friends he did have, he really didn't try to keep those relationships up. He didn't get married, he didn't have kids. Instead, the tamping iron became sort of like his best friend. He took it everywhere with him, even posing at one point with the tamping iron the way you would expect a couple to pose for a photo. Twelve years after his horrific injury, Phineas would develop seizures, likely from the injury, and then he would die with his beloved tamping rod right by his side. His case changed neuroscience forever by showing that an injury to the brain could affect specific personality traits. Today, Phineas's skull and his tamping rod are on display at Harvard Medical School. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more bone chilling content, be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts, Mr. Ballin Medical Mysteries Bedtime Stories. Just search for Ballin Studios wherever you get your podcasts and you'll find them all. Also, there are hundreds more stories like the ones you heard today, but in video format on our YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. I really appreciate your support until next time. See you.